So, hi, I'm uh, Nicholas Koloff. I'm the director of Arcadius Foundation, uh, which is based in Switzerland. It's a private family foundation. And we support enterprise support organizations uh, in Africa and in Latin America, uh, of whom two are represented here. So Ali from Village Capital and Alexandra from Be Peace, Business Council for Peace. And we work very closely. We feel like a twin to small foundation. <laughs> uh, Karina is represented here. And we're going to talk about the five ways that may help our enterprise sport organizations and their funders uh, create more impact. And who's this session for? Well, it's for both uh, enterprise sport organizations. It's who want to think about um, what they do, how they do it, what does the evidence say about how one might improve the quality of your performance in helping enterprises? Uh, it's for funders um, who obviously work with enterprise sport organizations to help them think through how to help those organizations get better at what they do and perhaps make uh, better choices about who to work with based on the evidence. And if you're an entrepreneur thinking about business development sports services, uh, these characteristics might help you find the right one for you. So hopefully there's something in this session for everyone. So why is this important? Uh, why was this important to us? Well, about 10 years ago, and we started supporting small and growing businesses, of which a significant subsection are social enterprises, we um, uh, didn't know actually what worked? Did business interventions actually work? Did accelerators, for example, actually accelerate? Were they just good at picking winners and then doing stuff to them, which made absolutely no difference to their performance whatsoever, but at least kept the accelerator busy? We didn't know. Nobody knew. So we thought, okay, well, if we're going to spend money and resources and time and effort uh, helping enterprises, we better know whether business development services work, and if so, how? So how did we go about finding out? Well, we supported over 50 organizations who were running over 100 programs in over 500 cohorts, which represents about 10,000 plus businesses. And we measured the same thing. We measured three points, revenue in increase, full-time employment, and capital raise, because we thought that might indicate what did uh, resilience and growth in enterprise look like. And we evaluated individual programs. Uh, several of our partners suffered our evaluations. And we looked and we talked to entrepreneurs in particular about, so what was it about those programs that you felt actually really helped? And also what things actually didn't really help. So we looked at those. And then we also sponsored uh, research uh, in the field. So amongst around specific interventions. So we helped develop GALI, the Global Accelerator Learning Initiative, of which Village Capital was an early adopter, um, to see whether accelerators actually accelerated and did they work. And the outcome of GALI was, yes, they did. If they did, X, Y, and Z. And X, Y, and Z we'll look at in great detail, great detail uh, this afternoon. And then finally, we kind of went out and collated everything as far as we could find everything, that other people were learning. So everything from a random control trial in China around business networks, or one in Mexico looking at the benefits of individual consultancy. We looked at businesses at different stages and different ages, and there are a whole range of different kinds of intervention. And you could have ended up with one glorious mess of data and confusion. But no, we ended up with a series of patterns emerging about what does good look like when it comes to business development services. And in order to make this digestible, and because of the industry in which we work, we came up with an acronym. What else? And the acronym was SCALE, which we thought was kind of appropriate, since that's what we were trying to help businesses do. And SCALE stands for Select the Right Enterprise. Uh, charge the enterprise what you're doing, not necessarily the full economic cost, but charging creates a, a client, commercial, committed kind of relationship. Address problems because we learn when we're problem solving. 
most people, and particularly entrepreneurs who are incredibly busy, want to solve a particular problem. And then you could invite them to learn how to solve, not have that problem again. So if the problem is cash flow, um, solve that cash flow problem, and then invite people to learn what does cash flow mean, how to do it better, so you don't have the same problem. And uh, learn by evaluating enterprise performance, because you want to learn. So what does your monitoring, your evaluation, your learning system look like? It doesn't have to be complicated, but it needs to be there. And as an organization, lead by example. So if you're helping businesses develop their strategies, do you have a strategy yourself? If you're building a quality team in your organization, in, in the enterprises you support, what does your team look like? And are you building one that's effective? So we put scale with the help our friends at Dahlberg into a report and tools, which you can find on our website, argidius.com. Now, I can't claim that this report is bedtime reading unless you're an insomniac, uh, but it's not meant to be. It's meant to be a series of explorations around how to think about your programs and how to do programs uh, better. And it's not designed um, to be a prescriptive framework. You know, follow scale and you will do good. Um, what it is, is a series of lenses to help people think about what does good quality look like. So with that more ado, that more I'm gonna ask Ali, first of all, to talk about Village Capital's results and what are the key characteristics of success that they've noticed um, about the work that they do um, in supporting enterprises that they work with? Great, thanks, Nicholas. It's it's great to be here. Excited to have this conversation today. Um, for those of you who don't know uh, Village Capital, we are a supporter um, and investor in seed stage impact driven entrepreneurs around the world. Over the last decade plus, we've trained about 1,100 entrepreneurs on investment readiness and other technical support, um, and we're also working to build more uh, robust and inclusive ecosystems around those entrepreneurs. Uh, so the 1,200 entrepreneurs, I'm sorry, I said 1,100, but it's actually 1,200 now, and we've support, uh, supported, have gone on to raise collectively uh, $4 billion. Um, and according to the Global Accelerator Learning Initiative, they're raising more capital uh, than the average entrepreneur. They are generating more revenue and creating more jobs. Um, what's particularly unique about Village Capital is that we deploy a peer review based model to make investment decisions. So um, we have a process by which entrepreneurs not only learn what it means to be investment ready, but evaluate both the merits of their own business um, as well as uh, their cohort members' businesses, um, and then assess uh, the investment readiness of the entire cohort to make a selection of two to three entrepreneurs per cohort who receive investment. So through that process, we've run about uh, close to 90 programs using that process and facilitated um, more than 100 investments um, through that process as well, uh, both from our affiliated venture fund as well as from other co-investors. So I'll pause there, Nicholas, and, and happy to kind of jump in uh, where you want to take it. I think you're on mute. Nicholas, where I'm not hearing you, unfortunately. Are you hearing me now? Oh, great. Yeah, super. Uh, so, Ali, if you if you are thinking about you know the and um, the the changes that Village Capital have made to its programming over the last few years, and you're thinking about what you'd learned, which a couple of things you know really had learned that had most effectively help entrepreneurs, which you think that not just for village capital, but more broadly for other enterprise support organizations, what would you what would you pick out as key things? Yeah, a couple of things um, in sort of going along the uh, scale uh, metric, uh, six scale diagnostic. Um, first, when it comes to selection, starting early um, in inviting collaborators in to make decisions on how to, to go about selecting a cohort of entrepreneurs to support. Um, so we start 
immediately from identifying a potential problem we want to solve. We find other experts, other funders, other potential partners, customers of these uh, companies, corporates, uh, potentially people in the public sector to help us really refine a problem statement that we want the cohort of entrepreneurs to be solving. Um, and so uh, we start very early on in bringing in different perspectives in the selection process. That group also then gets involved in our multi-stage selection process um, to help us evaluate uh, the potential for these companies um, to not only become investment ready, but to be a uh, really diverse set of entrepreneurs who can make good decisions because we use the peer review based process. So, so number one, I would say continuing to think about how to bring diverse perspectives into the selection process and expert perspectives into the selection process. Um, another is um, in the, the process itself. So um, we started the, the peer review based model from the earliest days. Um, but what we found was not only are we helping companies better understand what it means to be investment ready, um, but by creating more interactions for entrepreneurs to learn from each other versus far less time of us lecturing at them, um, that was really transformational for these entrepreneurs. Is facilitating a place for them to learn from each other was just as powerful as us delivering content. Um, so we dramatically reduced the amount of content that we were delivering in our curriculum and really focused on how do we create an environment where um, the entrepreneurs can learn from each other. So those are a couple of the things that I would say um, we've really leveraged. And um, as I said, you're an early adopter of Galley, and it might be um, scary to put yourself to external scrutiny. I mean, what happens, you know, when you get the results? So what what's important? What was important in in allowing yourself to have that data scrutinized externally? Um, what do you? What were the incentives to do that? And <laughs> uh, and what and what and what and what did you learn through that process, particularly when it came to monitoring and evaluating your own uh, performance? Yeah, yeah, uh, it's a great question. And uh, and yes, it is uh, uh, scary to sort of say, okay, we'll go, we'll go for it. Um, we will. Uh, be okay if the results are not great and we'll be excited, but also want to learn. And the spirit of Village Capital has always been about learning um, and transparency. So, um, you know, the original idea of peer selection was um, sort of, and, and maybe by some still viewed as a bit wacky and sort of uh, not uh, the normal path for making investment decisions, the idea that we can flip the power dynamic. Um, so it was sort of in, embedded in our DNA to say, like, we want to find new and better ways to do things. And if we are not also sharing that information with others, um, then we're doing ourselves a disservice and we're doing the sector a disservice because we want to find transformational ways to get to entrepreneurs who have really great, great solutions who are often... Um, overlooked by the early stage investment ecosystem. So I think that made the decision to participate in Galley a lot easier because it was part of our ethos to, to be learning and innovating um, and and really sort of be public about what we learned. So um, one of the, the things we, uh, we've we done, you know, both with the Galley learnings and trying to figure out sort of um, are we, is it better, for example, is it better to have a high volume of applications or is it better to have a low volume and high quality? Of course, we found the latter. So we really refined our recruitment process to say, how do we actually find the entrepreneurs who are very uh, suited to the problem statement that we've established um, instead of saying like, hey, we want to have a big PR blast around this application process. We, of course, want to um, be as broad and inclusive in recruitment, but we know that the best quality cohorts come from having uh, the most aligned entrepreneurs who are part of the application process. So that's definitely one of the things we learned um, from Galley. And we also, you know, sort of saw that there was the there was an improvement in the performance of entrepreneurs, um, but we really wanted to understand how peer selection also made a difference in um, in both predicting the um, potential of a company to generate revenue and also to uh, raise additional capital to continue to grow their businesses. So in addition to the Galley data, we did our own sort of external evaluation of the peer selection process, and we were very public about publishing um, sort of what was working and what wasn't um, in peer selection as well. I mean, that's super. Yeah, you know, when I asked my my board that we would actually publish every evaluation that we made, I was expecting them to to um, gulp and say no. <laughs> and in front of that, they just said yes. 
um, absolutely important. And I think it's it's been really important to be able to 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 do that as a, as a service for people to see both the things that work and successful, the things that are less successful, and to encourage people that just because nothing, not everything goes according to plan, that's an opportunity to learn rather than to, to hide. Um, I've got a question in the chat um, about um, from Jimena, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, who's in uh, LATAM, um, Building Programme for Entrepreneurship. Um, and they find, he's saying he's, they find it difficult to create spaces for entrepreneurs to interact and learn from each other in an online learning program. So do you have any suggestions on how you might do that? And that's certainly a challenge over the last couple of years around digitalization, because a lot of, as we know, a lot of the, the learning that people do is, is informal. Um, it's, you know, over the coffee break, uh, uh, waiting for the person to start talking. Um, what's your problem? Oh, I'm having this problem. How do we solve it? So how do we, yeah. how do you think we can do that better online? It's a great question and it's not an easy one to answer. I wish I said, I, I wish I had a magic solution. One of the things we did um, when uh, the pandemic hit and we knew we needed to transition to a fully virtual program was completely revamped the structure of our program. So we didn't revamp our curriculum per se, but we said, okay, normally we do, um, you know, one week of uh, eight hours a day of in-person programming. And then the entrepreneurs have a break where they're working on their businesses and sort of doing their homework from the first week. Um, that model, and then, you know, sort of two more weeks with a month break in between. Um, that model wasn't going to work online. You can't ask people to be on Zoom for eight hours a day. Um, that, that's definitely not going to facilitate great learning or interaction. So we shifted uh, the structure of our programs where there was some intense sprint weeks um, but we weren't keeping people online for more than a couple of hours a day. Um, the facilitation of um, learning in smaller groups um, required more human capital from our team. Um, that was one of the things that we found is we needed to be more uh, involved in facilitation of the learning sessions and making sure that people were having conversations and sort of shifting and steering the conversations and that they understood the frameworks. Um, so we did, I, I do feel like we've lost that sort of informal, or, you know, we do some virtual happy hours and we have some uh, interactive um, games that we have people play to just to get to know each other and to build that trust. Um, but we really are hoping that we can ultimately get back to somewhat of a hybrid format so that we can facilitate more of the in-person peer-to-peer learning. Um, certainly, you know, I would suggest sort of trying to spit, not, not trying to keep everybody um, in one place uh, for too long in a virtual format. Um, creating more structured activity for that learning. So it does require more facilitation instead of that um, sort of natural um, thing that happens when you're in person, uh, as we were talking about humans being loud uh, when we're in person at a dinner um, and uh, and being really much more intentional about creating those spaces. Um, and uh, and I'm, we will continue to share uh, what we're learning um, as we as we always do. So happy to, to follow up on this too in the next six months. Oh, thanks, Ali. Uh, Karina, so you're on you're on the other side of the. I'm not saying the fence because you're not divided by a fence. Of course. <laughs> uh, but anyway, you're a funder. So what does what does what does this work mean to you, and how would you apply uh, what's been characterised as scale uh, in the work that you do as Small Foundation? Sure, um, and maybe I'll just give a very brief intro to, to what Small Foundation does and, and how we, we look at um, kind of business development support organizations. Um, so Small Foundation is an Irish-based uh, charity. Uh, we focus on the elimination of extreme poverty in sub-Saharan Africa, and we do that very much with an ecosystem building lens. So we are aiming to increase access to knowledge, technology, markets, skilled human resources, and finance for what, um, what we call rural impacting micro, small, and medium enterprises. That's a lot of a lot of words, but what that really means is that we support a range of intermediaries um, with business development support organizations being uh, a key component of that. And our goal is really to increase the sustainability and the impact uh, uh, of those particular organizations. And, and I know, Nicholas, you mentioned that, that we're, we're kind of like twins, but I would uh, characterize our Gideas Foundation as maybe the slightly older and more sophisticated twin 
who does things first. <laughs> so we have been learning from our Gideos Foundation for several years and are, um, appreciate the intentionality with uh, how you've been measuring the progress uh, and uh, impact and results of the different business development support organizations. And and, and come up with the scale framework because for small foundation, the scale framework has helped in, in I think, three key ways. Um, I think the first is really for us to incorporate it into our uh, evaluation process of looking at uh, business development support organizations. It allows us to really have a common language, not only internally to, um, amongst the team to talk about, well, what do we see are the strengths and weaknesses of the different organization, but also externally with the actual um, um, business development support organizations themselves to be able to talk about how are they having impact, how are they thinking about their scale. Um, and I think the second big thing is having that conversation with those business de development support organizations allows us to dig into very specific areas. So with the scale framework, we can say, you know, with S, select. Tell me a little bit more about how you are thinking uh, about your pipeline selection. Tell me who your target market is. How are you, you know? So it lets us to get to, down to a level of granularity or with, within a consistent frame. So, so we really like that. And it also allows us to draw on kind of best practices that we're seeing in the market. So we can say, oh, well, you know, we're seeing, you know, in the select, you know, component, these are some of the, you know, strategies that people are using to overcome some of these challenges that you might be having. And, and I think the last bit for us, the scale framework also allows us to to really pinpoint where small foundation might be able to support a business development support organization. So like, how do we want to point our funding? What areas do we think will really help um, the business development support organization scale? So, it, it, and, and actually we are working with Village Capital to develop a diagnostic tool that incorporates scale more intentionally to actually see those specific areas for improvement and to understand the market landscape uh, for these business development support organizations. So I think there's a lot of different ways that um, the scale framework can really help funders like us and people who are in the, you know, trying to build that intermediary market. Yes, uh, thanks. And then, uh, that's certainly how we've tended to look at it. We've been able to look at an organization um, see its strengths and weaknesses, have a conversation with the organization. Um, actually, we invite organizations to actually um, um, self-evaluate. Uh, and then you can begin to talk about, say, this is how we can direct the support to you to strengthen your organization in these areas. Mm -hmm. You're very strong in these areas. Let's strengthen you in these areas and then move you forward in, in that kind of way. And if you, if you um, looked at the sort of funder uh, landscape. Um, how how do you how do you feel we're doing um, as funders in thinking about um, effectiveness? Um, that's a that's a really good question. I I think we could do a lot better. I mean, like I said, Nicholas, you guys have been at the forefront of really being intentional about what we're measuring, and I think effectiveness is is hard to to measure because there are so, there's such a diversity of approaches out there and actually different needs amongst the the enterprises and and i think that the scale framework also helps us think about segmentation and how you might be thinking about effectiveness for different types of organizations whether it's a you know tech enabled high growth you know enterprise that's really looking to scale incredibly or a smaller SME working in a rural area that's never going to have achieve significant scale but still contributes a lot to the economy and effectiveness for each of those will be slightly different so i think i think it's a start of a conversation that the funders have been been having but i think there's a lot more that we can do to actually you know dig deeper into what really works no. And certainly one of the things we want to try and do next year is to think about how to turn scale into a tool that entrepreneurs can use. So, so, because of, so often people, um, when you're talking to enterprise, say, why did you select this organization to work with rather than that organization to work with? And, and people go, well, I heard about that organization or um, they were the only ones that we thought were available. Or, and so to so help people because that matching that matching of, of organization and enterprise 
is one of the things that, that is so important uh, if you're going to have a successful kind of relationship. So, Alexandra, I'm going to ask, ask you, so, so um, you were our first test case, really, uh, on scale, in the sense that uh, we just sort of worked out this, this pattern, and then we sort of presented it to you and said, well, what do you make of this, and how do you think about your program now? And, and you made one or two very simple changes. Well, simple in the sense of um, they didn't cost you anything. Uh, <laughs> but, but, um, and so what, what did you, what, how did that work? So what did you notice when we first talked about this with you? And what changes did you make? And what was the impact of making those changes? Mm -hmm. Sure. Thank you, Nicholas. And, and again, um, delighted to be here and share some of the BPS experiences. I will just give, uh, for those of you who don't know BPS well, just an, a slight overview. Um, BPS is a 20-year-old global nonprofit. We work specifically in crisis-affected communities uh, to help small and medium businesses create jobs and grow. Um, our model really is to deliver high-quality, customized business consulting um, connecting them, matching is kind of a keyword we're using here, to expert um, volunteers. And um, those expert volunteers provide uh, pro bono services to them. We're working primarily with food processing, manufacturing, pharma, health, and services. And we do measure impact um, by three key indicators, and that is job creation, revenue growth, and access to finance. Um, and to your question, Nicholas, um, you're absolutely right that we made two uh, key kind of pivots um, with respect to the scale, using the scale framework. And one of them was around uh, a shift in free to, to fee, I think we can say. And that really centered around the premise that our our programs were were really free, right? They were, um, and, and to a certain extent, the businesses we supported were very much beneficiaries. So that simple shift in charging um, for our programs really brought them in as key stakeholders, clients. I think you mentioned that earlier, Nicholas, and they were very vetted and also very invested in participating in these programs and getting the most in terms of quality out of these programs. So their engagement um, clearly not just increased, but I would say it also created efficiencies with our program that our team and our staff didn't have to chase the businesses to participate or to engage or to even share data, which is really critical for us to be able to measure our impact. Um, that pivot uh, came through a lot of due diligence. Um, we had to get buy-in from our fast runners, we call the businesses we support. So the buy-in came in having really constructive conversations around how they would embrace um, fees. They also, it's important to note that they also are our largest referral system. So we really, until this day, even when we made that pivot, they are bringing great candidates into our pool. Um, so we didn't want to lose that. We didn't want to lose their engagement. So bringing in, bringing them into the conversation was absolutely paramount. Um, and they understood that we really had a clear business case. The business case was that our experts provided um, services, expertise that really were out of their reach, right? They're, they're, we're working in um, conflict communities. So again, we work with PwC, with McKinsey experts, and, and they just do not have access. And access really was the key fundamental thing that kind of stood out. So being able to make a business case around a value, we put a monetary value in terms of what those consulting fees would be, which we um, estimated around 30,000 versus a nominal fee that we would charge, which was anywhere, again, scaled around revenue, anywhere around 500 to about 1500, depending on the revenue tier, annual revenue tier. And that made complete sense to them. It, it was as clear as day. So that buy-in was essential. Um, buy-in from our staff was also super essential because they were then shifting their mentality and, and to a certain extent had a resistance that now we have to sell our programs, right? And I don't have any sales experience. How are you putting me in this in this situation? So buy-in from our staff was absolutely fundamental. And they were really pivotal in doing all of the due diligence, talking to local chamber of commerce, membership organizations um, that had fee-based models, looking at the services they offered also in the landscape. And then also for them to kind of come to that shift of, wow, what we really provide is not just 
really valuable, but we see the differentiator in terms of the services we, we have. And this is a nominal fee. And I think those two uh, fundamental things, getting buy-in from our businesses, the fast runners, buy-in from our staff, was absolutely key, as well as um, providing a, a tier-based structure that was really, really important. And then the other shift to Nicholas um, was around um, a few different things, but one in particular was our learning, right? We, we talk a lot about learning and evaluating. I think a fundamental um, strength that BPs has is that we do have field staff in the areas that we work and we spend a lot of time building trust and building uh, relationships. And because of that, we understand that a business is not just a business, it's a human, right? Humans start businesses. Um, we also really do uh, kind of bring a culture of transparency, confidentiality, because Again, we also did learn that we were bringing all these external great high-end experts into the equation, but similar to what Ali and I think Karina had mentioned before, these business owners are experiencing challenges that are very similar. The local cultural context that, that exists, political context that exists within their framework, they are key kind of uh, knowledge you know, transfers to each other. So that peer component really stood out for us in being able to be effective in how we shifted our programming from timing, for example. It used to be an 18-month program. We had all of these elements that were really, really intense. And the, and the business owner said to us, it's too much. We need to take a step back. We'd like to shorten the program. We'd like to bring in the peer element and have that time to talk, to share challenges, but also to inspire each other. Um, and as well as what we were asking was a lot in terms of the data collection. So keep it simple. And, and those really are kind of those three elements around the scale component around free to fee and then how we learned um, in general. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and I remember that um, um, that intensification and in the intensity of a program is really very important. So um, we can you can you can do too little and you can do too much. Right. And you can expect entrepreneurs to be learning too much. And, and what, you, what we've seen is you need to give people the time and space to actually implement what they're learning uh, for new challenges to emerge and then people to be able to help them address those challenges. So intensification is really important. And, but what happened to the, the impact between our, our first cohort, um, which was could do better, and the second cohort? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that was really one of those aha moments for us because there were a lot of um, reservations around that that free to fee model, a drop off in applications. I think Ali, you mentioned the qual the quantity, right? It's not that's not what matters, but the quality. Um, we definitely experienced a drop off in terms of the number of candidates that were initially brought in, but the quality of applicants was significantly higher. Um, as well as the the fee based model really bringing up the engagement and kind of that client shift in mindset that I want to make the most out of this program I want to make the most out of all of these interventions that are occurring and really the results were phenomenal in terms of increased job creation increased revenue incremental revenue growth and access to capital so it was ultimately I would say about um, 60% growth in job creation and um, almost double in terms of revenue creation. And that was just over 12 months. What we are seeing, um, and, and again, this has to do everything to do with kind of the relationship with the businesses, we do track um, their, their data over longer periods of time. We're able to continue to, even if we say there's a two or three year post-program um, requirement, we do invite them to bring it to continue to share our data because we're also uh, giving a value add to them by benchmarking around their peers, by also giving them historical kind of context in terms of how they've grown or where there were potential ebb and flows within their performance and say to them, okay, you had a drastic drop off, what happened? And, and sometimes we uncover very important things around um, non-diversification of revenue as it represents their clients, right? They're heavily invested with two clients versus, you know, having a robust portfolio. So we're really able to, to continue and to intervene and to offer value to them. 
um, throughout a longer trajectory. And I think that has enabled us, one, not just to collect the data, but to also continue to elevate them and really get their mind shift to say, this is important. We want to do it. We want mm-hmm. to incorporate it. And we also want to continue to share. No, no. no it was that, was that moment of, of, your, of your data when I fell off my chair. <laughs> um, 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 and thought, gosh, I've been doing this stuff for 25 years, and and I've actually have actually stumbled on something that really does work. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it's 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 and again, it's not it's not prescriptive. It's just looking at this through a series of lenses and going, ah, this is something we might like to adjust, and in that adjustment, really being able to serve one's clients um, better. So. Um, a couple of questions in the box. So um, another question from, from Latin America, which is, if the focus is on low-income populations and, mm-hmm. um, and, and there's been a discussion about charging, and this is a question to, to everybody who might have some wisdom on this thought. Um, so how and when to collect fees and how much to charge? And, and I think we already asked, will you get less candidates? Yes, possibly, but possibly better candidates or more committed candidates. Um, any suggestions? So open to the floor for quick suggestions on charging. Uh, I, I can start. Um, Jimena, we also work in in um, in Latin America, particularly in Central America, Guatemala and El Salvador. So so oftentimes we do work with businesses that um, that are challenged economically. And we do take that into consideration. I think one of our considerations is to balance our portfolio. I think we talk about diversifying our own revenue as organizations that support um, entrepreneurs. But I think it's also really important for for us when we're selecting businesses to also diversify your candidate pool so that you can make these changes and can make accommodations um, when necessary. So perhaps a strategy for, for you would be to identify a certain sector or a certain industry within that rural context that does have the ability to potentially pay more that could offset maybe the co-op or the really rural business that doesn't necessarily have that, that ability to, to pay a significant fee. And then I think we all talked about um, tiering, um, you know, tiering that, that fee-based model based off of what the annual revenue is. But asking these questions, I think, to be able to understand where they fall in terms of those, those um, tiers, in terms of revenue, is how you're going to be able to come to, I think, an easily, easily sellable um, fee-based yeah. model. Yeah, and, uh, and I think certainly in the context, um, it's really important to think of this as, as, as the importance of, ch- of charging as a, as, a, as a signal to the market, not in terms of your own revenue. Right. And, and therefore, it's nominal but significant. So, so if one's thinking in the low income community context, think in terms of, well, what would be a meaningful fee, which may sound entirely meaningless in relation to our own sustainability and our own financing, but is actually meaningful to the potential client, because they will think that this is something they have to think, they're thinking carefully about. Do I want to do this? Is this the right thing to do for me? At this moment in my entrepreneurial enterprise journey, um, and do I want to commit myself to this? And having done it, does this does this um, help maintain that commitment uh, going forward? So here's um, probably um, one for you, Ali, which is about the correlation, perhaps, between the maturity of a company and the impact of the support. And is there an inflection point um, from which companies are far more likely to benefit from acceleration programs? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and I would maybe reframe the, the first of the two questions um, around a correlation of maturity of the company and the type of support that's needed. Um, so I, I think all companies at multiple stages benefit from uh, a peer-to-peer environment. Um, that's, that's sort of been our experience. I'm curious uh, for, for others as well. Um, but the level of depth um, of which a, where a company needs support certainly um, gets changes over time as a company matures. So we focus largely on very early stage entrepreneurs, sort of generally post revenue, but uh, and post idea stage. But they're typically we're you know when we're investing, we're one of the first checks in 
some of the companies we've supported have raised a bit of money and um, we focus on investment readiness very specifically because these are companies who will be seeking capital to grow their businesses. But that doesn't make sense for every type of company or every maturity. There are different programs at other organizations that focus on digging into specific aspects of the business um, that a company needs to address at a later stage of the company um, in its maturity or companies who have different growth profiles need different types of technical support, which is why um, it's great that there is this incredible ecosystem of BDS providers that have different um, skill sets and abilities to to meet those needs. So I don't think it's a matter of impact versus maturity. I think it's a matter of what is the right support for the company at that particular time and based on their um, particular plan. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'd sort of answer the the, the second question. Um, acceleration programs, I think, benefit companies typically at an earlier stage. I think you have to kind of reframe um, a program from acceleration and a cohort-like model to a different type of support to accelerate a growth of company at a later stage, which is why you don't see a lot of um, accelerators that are focused on sort of post if we're using sort of venture rounds, although I think those are kind of meaningless at this point. But if we use post series B companies, those typically are companies who need a lot more hands on support from investors, um, and probably are less likely to benefit from a more traditional accelerator model that's sort of the the three ish month model, they have different types of support that they need. Yeah, no, that's great. And, And we set out to look and see whether whether um, we looked at formalizing businesses, we looked at dynamic businesses, we looked at venture businesses, so businesses at different um, uh, ages and scales, we looked at different kinds of intervention because we were trying to think when we started our strategy, oh, it's going to be acceleration and, 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 and venture businesses, that's where the impact's going to be. And, uh, and then we can pour in and do all of that and forget everyone else. And in point of fact, we found impact at every level and the disaggregator was not either the kind of intervention or the nature of the business is, were they following this pattern that we've come to call scale? That's, that made the difference uh, in terms of quality rather than, than, than anything else. Um, question about, uh, yes, um, um, in response to uh, Lisa, who asked, you know, the three metrics that we used are more financially and business measures. And that was deliberate because we wanted, to, we had a very narrow question, which is what's a good business intervention look like? Um, but any thoughts on the effect of accelerators on social and environmental impact? And and how would we know? How would we look at that? How do we look at that? And we've got two minutes, <laughs> I think. I'll jump in very quickly uh, and be far less than two minutes because we do focus on impact-oriented companies who are solving problems in uh, economic opportunity and environmental sustainability and and say that I I don't have a great answer beyond making sure that the businesses are very focused on solving those problems and helping them define the type of impact that they want to have in the world and the belief that if those businesses are successful, if social and environmental impact is at their core, that there is a, a benefit to helping them grow their companies, helping them raise the money that they need, for example, in order to, to have that impact. Um, certainly not every um, entrepreneur support program is thinking about the types of companies that they're supporting in, um, in the ways that we do, but they have they have different sort of community and, and uh, social impact metrics. So I'm sure others have thoughts on this too. Yeah. Anyone, any other thoughts? Yeah, I'll I'll add that we really do make um, social and environment a component of our selection. So when we're filtering candidates, we do ask the the hard data, and then we also take into account kind of the soft components around what their policies are, around gender diversity and inclusion, about what if they have policies or at least are willing to implement policies around climate. And I will say that um, oftentimes, even if the the candidates do not, they are doing things because of the nature of of where we work, developing economies. They're hit by climate change. They're hit by many social, economic, and gender-based issues that exist. So oftentimes, it's just bringing kind of that business case to them, that it's not affecting their bottom line, but actually going to increase their profitability that really does allow them to kind of have that shift of focus. But always maintaining that, I think, that balance, right, where we're not trying to instill all of these new policies or best practices or governance that's really going to negatively affect the business. 
Yeah, and and we've been we've been looking at um, certainly how to help um, our partners think about so what are some of the basics of what the minimum standards of work, what does decent work look like? Because we're we are focused on creating full time employment, but that only matters if the full time employment is actually a good job, uh, not just any job. Um, and how do you have conversations with the enterprises you're working with to take people on a journey of thinking about what does that look like? And how do you incrementally improve over time um, your uh, your workplace uh, and the employment you're generating? Um, but certainly for us, we wanted, yes, as I said, we wanted to find out what does good look like? Because I could have gone to my board and said, yeah, we've got this fantastic social enterprise and it provides clean drinking water for a million children in Uganda. I wouldn't have known whether the partner that worked with that made any contribution whatsoever to that success. And that's the thing I wanted to know. Um, that's what we wanted to know, and that's what we brought scale to to look at in that in that kind of in kind of way. Um, and and that's that's why it's been important. So um, I think we are out of time. We're about to be out of time. Um, I'm not entirely sure how this ecology this ecology this technology works. Um, but um, until I'm cut off, I'm going to say one more thing. So my my favourite learning from scale. Um, was that 90% of people learn because they have a challenge or a problem. 10% of people enjoy learning for its own sake. That's my guess, really. They really enjoy learning for their own sake, particularly if an entrepreneur, particularly if you're challenged, you know, in terms of time and pressure and so on. And the way we, we encapsulate this was to ask people how many people, when they buy a car or plug in their new washing machine, do they read the manual before they use it? And usually about uh, one in 10 people put their hands up and say, yes, I do. You know? And the other nine people say, no, I just wait until the red light flashes at me uh, and, and I want to know what it means and I read the manual and I fix it. And, and that um, triggers that sense of, and it has a jargon, it's called reverse curriculum. So you help person solve a problem, they're excited about solving the problem, and then you enable people to learn around why not, how to not have that problem again. And I think one of the challenges around the design of curricula is the people who design curricula are the people who love, the one in, one in 10, who love learning for its own sake <laughs> and therefore can't understand why people, you know, uh, are particularly, you know, time constrained people actually find themselves um, not doing that and, 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 and learning picking up against your own experience. So I'd like to thank you all uh, for participating. Uh, and if you want to see more on scale, it's on the website, go to argidius.com, go to learning. Scale is the first piece you'll find on learning. Uh, download it, share it with your friends, um, read it at night, read it during the day uh, and enjoy. It. Um, and hopefully it will be helpful in thinking through how to develop better organizations. Mm -hmm.